All right, I think we'll get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us for the Brainix Community Live session uh, for February 2022. So we are very excited to have some great speakers today and a very exciting topic. But before we get to that, I want to introduce myself. I'm Piyush Mathur. Uh, I am the co-founder of BrainX and BrainX Community. I'll tell you about BrainX Community to, to start with. Uh, we started this, as you can see in the picture, as a small group with the idea that we need to promote the idea of uh, machine learning application in healthcare or AI in healthcare for good. We have had three plus very successful years growing this community, now crossing 4,000 members internationally. We have a very active LinkedIn group, which has 2,000 plus members. And we have a lot of resources that I'll show you uh, through the next few slides, but also we do these monthly live sessions over here to share the evidence behind AI application in healthcare. So this is our website, brainnextai.org, and it has many components. This is the, the main web page. So the latest updates are available right through the main web page. We have the connect section where we have information about our upcoming monthly live sessions and also the recordings uh are the links to the recordings to the prior sessions if you want to find all of them we have our own brain x community youtube channel you can subscribe that you can get the latest recordings available to you we have a very active linkedin group it's recently crossed 2000 plus members internationally and it has members from all different uh, phases of life. There are engineers, there are physicians, there are clinicians, there are uh, members from all different uh, countries that have joined us and share uh, scientific information through this very active group. We have the learn section where we provide some of the key articles that have gotten published recently. And uh, this list of art links to these articles are uh, classified based on the specialty that they belong to. You have the filter option, so you can find the specialty that you're interested in and, uh, and find the key articles related to that. We have a whole list of journals that are very focused on AI application in health, healthcare. So again, if you go to the learn section and filter it by journals, you can find those key journals and uh, go to them directly. We recently added the books section. So if you are interested in learning more and want to read some of the key textbooks around AI and healthcare, uh, they are available through our learn section by filtering for books. And then we have one of the most popular uh, data segments, which has uh, the most exhaustive list of uh, links to open source data sets for AI and healthcare. So when you go to these data sets, which are classified based on different specialities and have some brief information about what's there in the data set, just click on the link. It will take you to that data set. It's only open source data sets that are linked over here. So I know we are all data hungry. Uh, this is a great resource of, we have made available to you. We also have our uh, special podcast series called BrainX Talks. It's available through Apple, Google, Spotify, whichever your favorite channel is. Uh, subscribers, and you will get to listen to conversations with some of the experts who have been working in this field brought to you. You will uh, learn about their experiences, why they are engaged in this field, and what is their vision for the future. And of course, uh, now that COVID is dying down uh, and hopefully gone forever, uh, all these meetings are coming back. And we have our meeting the section on our website so that you can find where you can connect and network and learn uh, uh, by going to your next meeting related to AI and healthcare. Uh, something that is coming up and you're getting a sneak preview is our 2021 year in review. So for the last uh, three years, we have done an exhaustive review. Uh, of publications so every year uh, based on our PubMed search methodology. We look at what was published in the prior year and uh, it's going to be coming out soon. So stay tuned to our website and our LinkedIn page because that information is gonna come out within a couple of days. Uh, but I want to share this, uh, this figure with you ahead of uh, our publication where you can see at the bottom surgery, which is the theme for the day, 
has had quite a few uh, different publications uh, over the years. So if you see 2018, 19, 20, and 21, the number of publications has been growing. 2021 uh, has been a challenging year, probably because of COVID. But despite that, the number of publications in all areas are growing in, in surgery too, as you can see in the bottom. And that brings us to the, the theme for the day, uh, this remarkable paper uh, that was published uh, in Science Robotics on Autonomous Robotic Laparoscopic Surgery for Intestinal Anastomosis caught our attention and caught attention of many others. And we thought it would be great to have a session on this, learn from uh, the, the various uh, uh, authors who have worked on this. So we will start off with uh, Axel Krieger, who's an assistant professor, Department of Mechanical and Engineering at Hopkins University, uh, or Johns Hopkins University, uh, and his team of Hamid Saidi, uh, who is also an assistant professor of Department of Computer Science, uh, now at University of North Carolina, uh, Wilmington, uh, and then Justin Offerman, who's currently an MSPhD student at Department of Mechanical Engineering, Johns Hopkins University. So they will kick us off by presenting this paper. And then we are joined uh, by Dr. Frank Pepe, who is the chair for Dermatology and Plastic Surgery Institute at the Cleveland Clinic, and also the co-founder of BrainX and BrainX Community with me. Uh, he is going to uh, host a panel, which includes Dr. Carla Pugh from, uh, who is the Thomas Crummel Professor of Surgery at Stanford University School of Medicine and Director of the Technology Enabled Clinical Improvement Center there. And we will definitely benefit a lot from, from her expertise in this field. And bringing us together, bringing us clinicians together is Daniel Hashimoto. So Dr. Daniel, Daniel Hashimoto uh, is currently the Flexible Endoscopy Forget Surgery Fellow at University Hospitals in Cleveland. Uh, an instructor in surgery at the Case Western Reserve University, but he has an amazing history uh, forming uh, the Surgical AI and Innovation Lab Laboratory. Uh, and he has also founded uh, and is the vice chair for the Global Surgical AI Collaborative. And he has a, a lot of publications and background in AI application uh, in surgery. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Professor Axel Krieger to uh, introduce his team further and uh, do his presentation. So thank you, Axel. Thank you so much for the fantastic introduction and uh, uh, an introduction uh, of our team and uh, BrainX. So let me share the screen and hope this works well. Can you see me? Uh, can you see the screen and hear me okay? Fantastic. Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Um, um, yeah, I'm joined today uh, in this presentation of our work uh, on autonomous ro uh, robotic laparoscopic surgery uh, by Hamid Saidi and Justin Opferman. Uh, Hamed was a postdoc in my lab uh, and then a, a research scientist and recently joined uh, the faculty at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. Uh, Justin is now a PhD student uh, that, uh, and Justin uh, was with me at Children's National uh, before uh, coming to Hopkins as a senior uh, research engineer. So I'm really glad to have uh, both the first and uh, second author of this uh, study here with us today. Um, so we will sharing uh, this presentation and uh, let's get started. Um, so why are we, uh, first of all, interested in uh, smart and autonomous surgery? First of all, it's, uh, of course, a very large market. Uh, there are over 230 million surgical procedures performed uh, per year worldwide. Um, and surgeries and interventions uh, heavily depend on, uh, of course, the uh, uh, experience skill um, of the operating surgeon. Uh, current state-of-the-art robotic surgery with a system such as the Da Vinci uh, is teleoperated uh, and every motion of the surgical tool is directly controlled by the operating surgeon. Um, while teleoperative surgery has simplified and increased the number of minimally invasive procedures, the overall complication rates and also the long-term patient benefits have not significantly improved. Uh, so current surgeries are predominantly performed under camera guidance without a direct link to preoperative medical imaging. And uh, in research and uh, 
and uh, commercially autonomous functions are very much limited to rigid bony anatomy and also very small subtests such as knot tying. So our vision uh, of a smart and more autonomous surgery consists of number one, augmenting critical portions of manual surgery with robotic precision with increasing autonomy. So surgeons then could uh, take on a supervisory role for some technically difficult portion of the surgery such as suturing. And number two, we'd like to provide the surgeons with the highest quality diagnostic images. And number three, preparing uh, surgeons with the most realistic plans and information. So the potential benefits are to reduce variability, uh, therefore complications, accelerate or eliminate the learning curve, and less enable new surgeries and procedures. So the fundamental challenge in soft tissue surgery, such as heart, liver, bowel, kidney, prostate surgery, are tissue deformations and un unpredictable shape changes. So what you see here on the left is an MRI image of a patient's small intestine. On the right, you see a picture of a porcelain small bowel anastomosis during one of our studies. So it's of course immediately obvious that any preoperative plan based on preoperative imaging would be close to useless during the reconstruction. After cutting, staging, and starting to suture, the anatomy just looks completely different than prior to surgery. Uh, this is a very different um, than, for example, orthopedic procedures where preoperative plans are highly reliable due to the lack of deformations. Of course, we can rely more on intraoperative imaging, such as color video, to direct our surgical robots but still remains a, a challenging task to robustly and accurately differentiate and track target tissue from background in such an unstructured, deformable surgical environment. On the right, you see an example of a urethra to bladder reconstruction. Um, so it's all quite of a sea of pink, very dif uh, difficult to find the bladder neck and the urethra here um, in this image and uh, overall in these kind of surgeries. So let's start by introducing our very specific research topic, uh, which is autonomous robotic anastomosis. Um, anastomosis, as you know, is the closing of tubular structures, and it's a necessary and critical part of all reconstructive surgery involving any luminal structures. Um, so there are over 1 million gastrointestinal, urologic, and gynecological anastomosis performed in the US alone. Um, what you see on the right is a colon anastomosis using sutures. So for example, after colon cancer surgery, um, taking out the uh, cancerous tissue, you need to reconnect the two ends of the bowel. Um, you start by approximating the two halves of the bowel and linearizing the suture. Uh, typically, uh, one would start with the back wall and then close the lumen on the front. So this suturing procedure requires a lot of dexterity, precision, repeatability. Imagine making one small mistake on these approximately 20 sutures. Um, which would immediately result in a leak and complication. So the complication rate is up to 19% for these uh, colorectal anastomoses. So this video shows the basic suturing technique. Um, so there you have a, a circular needle that is exchanged be between two needle drivers and uh, driven through the tissue in a rotating fashion. So imagine uh, trying to automate this procedure. So that is very difficult. You have to would find the needle, grab it correctly on both sides, drive it uh, through the tissue. Uh, so really just very complex procedure. So our goal is not just to replicate uh, what human surgeons are doing, but build robotic tools that are best for robotic use and simplify the procedure. So what are the research areas in innovations that we are working on to achieve more autonomous surgeries? Um, so first, we focus on novel robotic tools and robotic system developments to minimize deformations and simplify those procedures. On the right, you see our uh, latest uh, surgical robotic platform called the Smart Tissue Autonomous Robot, uh, which consists of two seven, seven degrees of freedom KUKA lightweight robots. Uh, one is equipped with a custom robotic suturing tool, and the second with a custom hybrid 3D in the infrared endoscope, um, all mounted on a surgical table. Uh, number two, we work on improving surgical imaging and planning uh, with a focus on 3D tissue tracking. 
to precisely guide our robot. Uh, lastly, we work on robot control strategies with in increasing autonomy that includes shared, supervised, and autonomous robot control with the goal to make things easier for surgeons and improve the performance. So with that, I hand it over to Hamed. Thank you, Axel, for the great introduction. So I'm going to explain some details about the robotic system and the control architecture in the next few slides. Uh, so basically what you see here is the motorized uh, robotic suturing tool that is mounted on one of the robots. It's basically an Endo360 suturing tool, which is used usually for manual laparoscopic surgeries. So we have two motors and a control software that integrates this robot, with, uh, this tool with the pitch actuation and a needle drive into our robotic system. So Alex, could you please go to next slide? Thank you. So we have a dual channel like camera system here. So one of them is a 3D imaging endoscope, which basically works based on a structured illumination techniques. So the way this works, it projects a set of fringes on a target tissue, depending on the deformation in the fringes. We eventually get a 3D point cloud data which represents the surface of the tissue that we are going to operate on autonomously. So we use this 3D information with suture planning strategies to plan autonomous sutures and then perform autonomous robotic suturing. Yes, next, next. So we have a second camera system, as I said, it's a dual cha channel camera system. One pro provides 3D surface information there's another camera called near infrared camera system, which use, sees a specific markers on the tissue, which are uh, used for targeting start and end points on the suturing lines that are used for the robotic uh, suturing processes. So we get this two information, 3D surface information, and then IR images, we fuse them together. Eventually what we get is a 3D version of these markers located on the tissue that we use for, for example, starting suturing line and then ending it uh, based on autonomously generated suture plans. So, yeah, can go to the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like Axel is trying to help me with the suture like slide translation. So, uh, so what you see here is the overall control black diagram of the system. So basically this, is a high level view of what's happening underneath the surface with layers of control codes controlling this robotic system. So what this black diagram means essentially is we use the camera system to track the motion of the tissue in the laparoscopic setting. For example, we have a patient that is breathing, the tissue is going up and down. We track the motion, figure out when the patient stops breathing temporarily. That's the case that we can measure the 3D shape of the tissue most accurately. We can do the suture planning and then use it for the robot to synchronize the motion with the breathing motion of the patient and then place the suture. So you get a set of suture plans, show it to the user through a graphical user interface. They need to approve or disapprove the plans or initiate a new planning. Eventually they can fine tune it a little bit. After they save the plan, Autonomous control performs a set of high level and low level motion controls to place the suture in the desired and planned positions autonomously. So one example of autonomous features available in our system is this uh, CNN based motion tracking method that we developed. One of the key challenges in the laparoscopic version of the star that we implemented was the motion of the soft tissue because the tissue was a stage on the abdomen skin. So it was moving a lot. And then we needed to make sure we plan the sutures correctly in certain location and then synchronize the motion of the robot. So we developed an algorithm using convolutional neural networks that looks at the uh, NIR view from the surgical scene, keeps track of position history past two seconds, relative direction of the markers in past two seconds, and then we collected a lot of data to train a neural network to predict when the tissue stops moving and then when it is moving so that we can use it in our control algorithms. 
So a little bit of what's happening under the hood. So we have numerous autonomous control features that you can see in the table. So they do tissue tracking, suture planning, autonomous suture placement, prediction of failure, filtering, and uh, several other features. Eventually, we still need to have a human in the loop for high-level supervisory roles, which in our case, the operator oversees the suture plans. If needed, initiates a replanning step, fine-tunes the location of the suture that are planned by the robot autonomously to make sure they are placed in the right location if needed. And if there is a need, operator can initiate a repeat stitch routine, which the robot basically repeats whatever was planned slightly differently for the next stitch. Okay, so here's a video of the workflow of how we basically set up the robotic system. So you have six degrees of freedom for the robot, one degree for the tool. You set the robot in a free drive or gravity compensation, insert it through a laparoscopic port, set it up, then you get suture plan and let the robot follow certain uh, autonomous steps, as you can see in this video. So this is a 6x speed video of uh, suturing on a phantom tissue. Basically, you see the tissue is moving here, left and right. Basically, it was up and down. So, And we get an autonomous plan, let the robot follow the autonomous plan after the operator approves it. So you saw examples of back wall and front wall switching. And eventually use the free drive mode again to remove the robot after the surgery is done and the suturing is cut. I guess so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Justin to explain the XV1 and Vivo results basically. Thank you, Hamid. So uh, now that we've got this great system and we're able to suture things on a table, you know, it's only natural to want to you know, create a method or some type of test strategy to really see how good it is. And so we did that by creating an ex vivo testing protocol where we had expert surgeons uh, perform an end to end anastomosis using synthetic tissue using either a laparoscopic approach, as you can see in the leftmost panel, or a da Vinci approach, as you can see in the middle panel. And we compared the results to the star system performing the same end to end anastomosis, as you can see in the right panel. For each of these tests, there were at least four samples. Um, and it's important to note that when we talk about the human samples, uh, we did have at least four different surgeons that were completing these tests because it's only natural to really include that variance that you see from user to user when you compare it to the autonomous system. Uh, what's also really interesting with this study is all of the tissues are mounted inside this ring. You can see these uh, white plastic ring there in the center of the image. And that ring is not only staging the tissue similar to what we would see in the preclinical study to come, but also it allows uh, somebody who's standing to the side to incorporate random deformations into the tissue. So we can really see how both the humans and the robot are able to adjust to those random deformations. And it also allows us to connect it to a breathing simulator. So we can test how well both the humans and the robot are able to track that motion in preparation for those living tissue studies to come. Once uh, we had our study design, you know, we also had to think of different types of metrics that we wanted to compare these tissues on, these samples on. Uh, and one of the most important we thought would be the number of what we call suture hesitancy events. These are essentially uh, mistakes or they're events in which a surgeon or the robot goes to place a needle, changes their mind, wants to change the location, places where you need to make small adjustments. We also considered the completion time for a user or the robot to perform the anastomosis as a surrogate for the efficiency of the task. And we also considered the consistency of the suture spacing and the bite depth for each of these stitches. And the suture spacing you can see there on the right is really the distance between two consecutive stitches. And the bite depth is that distance from the top wall edge to where the suture goes into the tissue. And both of these we feel are really important for high quality anastomosis because if you have high variance in your suture spacing, it doesn't matter if you do 19 out of 20 stitches correctly, you mess up on one and you're gonna have a leak which results in complications. 
So after we concluded the study, uh, we went ahead and plotted the data, and here's some of the key results we found. Um, most interesting, if you look at the suture hesitancy events in panel A, you see that the star system had significantly fewer hesitancy events. And we really rely and point this to star's ability to consistently track the tissue, uh, obviously find the deformations, adjust for those deformations. And when it's ready to go to a stitch, it's able to be confident in making that initial um, and final placement of that stitch. If you look at panel B, where we look at the completion times, as star sits today, it's similar in terms of procedure time to that of a laparoscopic procedure performing the anastomosis. Um, also interesting, if you look at it compared to the robotically assisted with da Vinci, while it is slower, uh, the knots and suturing time is almost identical. And so this really helps us uh, move towards the idea that in the future, if we wanted to run the robot a little faster to perform the knots and suturing, we would be able to achieve, we think, the same types of uh, suturing times that are seen in the da Vinci cases. When we talk about the suture spacing and the bite depth results shown in images C and E, we actually found that it would be better to normalize the data with the term called the coefficient of variance. We need to basically normalize these data because none of the surgeons were given a target suture spacing to achieve or a target bite depth to achieve. We asked the surgeons and the robot to complete um, the spacing and the bite depth, what they would use clinically. And so because there is variance in that, we need to normalize these data sets for a fair comparison. So that's why when you see in panels D and F, the star system after this normalization is able to achieve more consistent suture spacing um, and more consistent bite depth um, as opposed to the laparoscopic and similar consistency in bite depth as opposed to the robotically assisted. So once we had all these nice metrics, uh, you know, we really thought it would be great to qualitatively show that the anastomosis not just mathematically uh, was better or more consistent, but how would it look if you actually had fluid flow through this anastomosis? What would that flow profile look like? And so to do that, what we went ahead and did was take representative samples from the laparoscopic, the RAS, and the STAR studies, as you can see in the top two rows. And we went ahead and put them on a flow loop and put that flow loop inside an MRI uh, magnet. Now the fluid that we pushed through here had been doped, so it could be imaged easily with the magnet and using a 4D reconstruction software could recreate the flow lines of the fluid moving through the anastomosis. And you can really see these flow lines there in the bottom panel and see the laminar flow that's going through the star, uh, the star anastomosis as compared to some of the more turbulent flows um, especially what you see there in the laparoscopic setting. So once we had completed the ex vivo testing, um, you know, it was only natural and very exciting for us to demonstrate feasibility of this system in a living tissue. You know, there's lots of things you can try to simulate and test in the ex vivo tissue, but there's nothing like uh, compared going into the actual living tissue and seeing it really move, breathe, having blood randomly put into the scene. And so to demonstrate the feasibility of our system uh, handling all these tasks, we asked uh, an, extra, an expert surgeon to go ahead and stage manually uh, two loops of bowel inside four different animals. And you can see that staging there in the center picture. The staging is similar to what we had done with the ex vivo study. Um, and the staging is such that it allows the robot to really detect, see, and image those cut edges as it can reconstruct the plan that it needs to go around and suture that anastomosis closed. The panel at the right, uh, draw your attention to the placement of where we had five different laparoscopic ports. The pig's head uh, in this study is located at the top of the image. And so the robot is moving from the head of the pig down towards the feet. The largest port we had was the gel port. It's a three centimeter port that was sized to accommodate our camera system. And we're working now towards moving that down into a standard 12 millimeter size. The robot port was about one and a half uh, to two centimeters. And that was located there in the upper left. And the main assistant port was located lateral and just under one centimeter. We do have two additional assistant ports that were used in this procedure, um, but the assistant ports there were really so we had convenient access to insert endoscopic cameras to collect color images 
for later publications, creating uh, some of the nice videos you see in this presentation today, and they weren't really utilized. So I, even though this picture does have five, uh, it really can be performed in a setting of only three ports. Here we have an uh, actual video of the robot from the robot's point of view as it completes the anastomosis inside the living animal. On the left-hand side, you see the robot performing the anastomosis on the back wall. And you see those three near-infrared fiducial markers that the camera is imaging, tracking their position, and using those to measure deformations and motions of the tissue. As the uh, robot runs along, it performs a running stitch until it gets to the far right corner, at which point a surgeon manually flips that front wall, the top of the front wall down, and it aligns it with the front wall on the bottom as shown in the right image. And the star system continues its running stitch uh, around the complete lumen. At the end of the surgery, we went ahead and had the animals heal for one week, at which point we had a, a small necropsy to really look and evaluate what the tissue uh, would look like and how it would heal after one week's uh, post-surgery. Here you see in the center image and the right image, hardly any uh, visible difference between that of the star system in the middle and a laparoscopic control that we had the surgeon perform in the right. Looking at um, a cellular level, if you look at the left image, you see histological uh, samples and slides from an H&E staining with the star robot samples versus the control. And we didn't find any differences in the staining and the, the cell response indicating that the inflammation locally would be similar. In addition, all of the uh, samples from the pig uh, did gain average weight. Um, and then also by the end of our animal studies, we were achieving the same leak pressures and the same lumen patencies as that as the a trained expert surgeon uh, after years of, of practice and surgery. All these together, we really think are provide a good basis of feasibility that, uh, you know, doing autonomous soft tissue surgeries, not just science fiction anymore, science fiction anymore. This is now uh, moving into the realm of today and becoming a feasible task. Yeah, in, in summary, what we have shown is that autonomous robotic systems have the potential to perform complex surgical tasks, uh, in this case, uh, laparoscopic anastomosis, with higher accuracy and precision compared to MIS and RAS. And what was needed to accomplish this goal of autonomous soft tissue surgery included accurate tissue tracking, event detection algorithm, and novel, novel control strategies. So our next big step is to push for first in human studies, uh, which will require development of a miniaturized endoscope, uh, also replacing the current NIR tracking with markerless AI-based tissue tracking, since it would be very hard to receive clinical approval for use of uh, permanently implanted markers. And lastly, improving the fail-safe operation of STAR, so making it easier for the operating surgeon to make adjustments and intervene. Um, here's a very quick glance of what markerless uh, tracking could look like. Uh, this is an, a prototype algorithm consisting of two cascaded units, uh, providing a heat map of the corners of the tissue that were, we were aiming to suture. So it doesn't use any trackers as uh, all the previous work that we showed uh, here in this presentation. So the first unit takes uh, each individual grayscale intestine image as an independent input and outputs a segmentation result. Uh, and the second unit takes both the intestine image and the segmentation result from the first unit as the input and outputs the landmark heat map. So we tested the algorithm on uh, 25 images and achieved the landmark detection accuracy of about two pixels. So with that, I would like to thank um, all the co-authors uh, and our Immerse lab. And then, of course, all other collaborators and also our funding agencies for this work, uh, chiefly the NIH. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. Uh, uh, looking forward to discussing uh, this paper and uh, other uh, ideas with you. And here's also a link to our article. Thank you so much. Thank you, Excel, And thank you, Hamid and Justin. That, that was awesome. Uh, you made it 
appeared very simple. And I noted something that you said, uh, you said it still requires a human in the loop. You didn't say surgeon in the loop. So can an anesthesiologist like me do it too now? Uh, is that a suggestion? But again, it takes an anesthesiologist to get some of the great surgeons together to get this started, right? So uh, we, are, we are here and uh, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Pepe. And we have a whole host of amazing surgeons I see who are participating in this too. And uh, I would love to, to have the panel and the, the questions and discussion over here. So thank you, team. Uh, please stay, stand by and please uh, participate in the panel. So Dr. Pepe, over to you. Well, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Great, great. Uh, I see Dr. Hashimoto's on and, and Dr. Pugh. And just very quickly, I know that Dr. Mather introduced you, but can you reintroduce yourself uh, for some of the people that came on a little bit late? Why don't we start with Dr. Pugh? Hi, everyone. Uh, Carla Pugh, Professor of Surgery at Stanford. Uh, I spend a fair amount of my time uh, doing research on human performance. And I have always said that all the data that I collect will eventually train robots to do it uh, even better. You have to kind of know what surgeons do, all of it, more than a surgeon can verbally explain to you because it's unconscious. You have to know what a surgeon does um, in order to train a robot to, to do it. Uh, not just the technique, it's decision-making, but we'll get there. And Dr. Hashimoto? Hi, uh, yes, uh, I'm Dan Hashimoto. I'm the um, Forgot uh, and, and Flexible Endoscopy Fellow at University Hospitals. Um, did my uh, postdoctoral research at Mass General and MIT and uh, computer vision, particularly for intraoperative applications uh, with Daniela Roos at, at MIT. And uh, so just wanted to say thanks very much for having me and, and fantastic work by the Hopkins team here and uh, really putting together some great engineering and looking forward to a, to a good uh, discussion on how this, this might translate clinically. Yes, and, and again, my congratulations too. That was awesome. Um, a lot of questions. I started with 15. I added another 15 while you were talking. So we won't have enough time. And, uh, and, and it's really split between very technical things that I'm highly interested in. And some of the big questions that I would love uh, Dr. Pugh and Dr. Hashimoto to chime in. And, and the first question it is, is really in a very, very high level, sort of the medical ethics and the medical legal system of an autonomous surgical robot. And where does that play? And who, you know, obviously the surgeon is the captain of the ship and the legal responsibility. But what if something goes awry, you know, and how, how, how would that play out? Because I think this is going to be a big question, not just ethically, but medical legally. And why don't we start with Dr. Pugh, because she, uh, you know, she's interested in sort of the human performance. Yeah, so I have to openly admit I'm I'm a total geek at heart, and so anytime I see you know something relating to technology, I'm always you know what if you know and where can this go and what can we do and how does it benefit mankind, right? And so um, that that and, and focusing on on Dr. Pepe's question, you know, I mean, who who pays when the robot makes an error? Um, the irony. I have to admit, I never saw an attorney in any Star Trek episode. I'm just being facetious. I, I mean, so 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 if if we get to a point, or when we get to a point that we are accepting that robots can do surgery, I think the culture will have changed by then, right? The, you know, the, the studies show actually that human beings trust robots more than they trust other human beings. I, I kid you not. I mean, the, there's been studies in terms of, you know, robots interviewing patients um, and people are more willing to give health information in all details that they, because they fear judgment from another human being. So there is something there. Um, I, I think that where you are now, the devil's in the details in terms of, you know, the human in the loop part, um, as I'm looking at it, you know, the robot can't start suturing until the surgeon or somebody shows them the part that needs to be sutured and sets it up for them. So in that instance, the human who's in the room is going to be responsible and you're still, it's still a partnership. And so I think working on what that looks like, what is the partnership 
<laughs> between the anesthesiologist we blamed always, right? Because you, the patient always wakes up in the middle of the surgery and they're grabbing our instruments and everything. Um, yeah, I, th I think that in the, the transition part, while there's still human in the loop, the human is always going to be responsible. Um, but I, I still like to think of that far out part and culture will have to change. Um, Great answer. How about uh, Dr. Hashimoto? Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, as, as, as currently set up, I sort of see this as an extension of the stapler, right? Because there's so much setup that's happening from the surgeon in terms of um, setting up the bowel here. You think about the transfascial sutures that we use to hold it in place, the instrument coming in to pull the suture. I mean, if you think about it, if a stapler fails, yes, we love to blame the company that the stapler failed, but at the end of the day, we're responsible as surgeons if our anastomosis falls apart. And I think this is something very similar. Um, to Dr. Pugh's point, though, it's very interesting to think about the level five world that's coming in the future at some point to say that if I'm just drinking coffee in the break room while Pugh is, is monitoring the surgery and, and, and letting the anastomosis go, then, then who is responsible, <laughs> even if my name's on the card? Um, and so that's, I think, where the interesting question comes when it moves to that realm where we're okay with pushing a button and having a robot do the surgery. Um, that's a whole nother can of worms that I, I can't even begin to wonder what types of cultural transformations are going to be necessary, as Dr. Pugh said. Yeah, talk about staplers. It will be a very expensive stapler, too, I bet. So, you know, just, I could imagine the capital cost of this would be very extreme. But, you know, getting back to what, what doc, Dr. Pugh and Dr. Hashimoto was talking about that, Dr. Krieger, you know, you, you talked a little bit about high level supervisory roles in this and getting back to Dr. Pugh about the human element in this. You know, how often does the operator correct the robot? I mean, how often you can't spank and yell at a robot. So, you know, what what, what do you do? And, and how often in your sort of pig study and, and in your other studies, how often did you find that? I didn't see that reported in your paper. Um, yeah, fantastic question. Uh, so we were successful without any human intervention in 83% of all, um, you know, stitch placements. So we needed help in about 17%. And that typically occurred on the corners where it's really hard to get the tool in and there, you know, we needed some help, uh, some uh, adjustments to basically find the right spot to go in. Um, and yeah, I would I would agree that you know to the earlier question that of course uh, you know this is designed to help the surgeon to make it easier. Um, so you know the the analogy would be maybe like a, a modern car that uh, does the, has a parking assist. So if you have trouble parallel parking, just kind of helps you get in, and you're still responsible as the driver. Um, and we see it very similarly. Um, I also want to point out that in other areas of surgery, we are very used to using quite highly autonomous functions. If you think about uh, uh, you know, laser eye surgery, it's really pressing a button with, with your foot and then you know, the laser uh, energy is applied. Uh, you know, radio surgery with a cyber knife is, is highly automated. And even orthopedic surgery, like, uh, you know, for hip knee replacement is, has a very, very high degree of autonomy. So I don't think the culture shift will be so, so large. It's just, you know, a lot more difficult in, in soft tissue surgery. You know, and getting back to the capital cost of this, you know, we at the clinic a couple of years ago, uh, the head of a, or, the uh, orthopedic rheumatology, they wanted to buy robots for, you know, knee surgery and hip surgery and whatever. And they talked about the expense and I was on that committee and we brought up the papers that, you know, clinically it made no difference at all. I mean, the outcomes were basically the same, whether you used uh, a robot or not. And, uh, and they still went ahead, uh, the clinic, Cleveland Clinic still went ahead and bought it because the hospital down the street bought it, you know? So it was more of a marketing thing rather than a true, clinical outcome elements, you know, how do you see that playing out in this, this scenario? Do you think robots, uh, much like Da Vinci, you know, got on the market and now there's, oh, there's probably two dozen robot companies that are competing now, you know, do you think this will be the same thing where, you know, clinically the outcomes will potentially be better or the same, or, I mean, I, I know you can't predict, but, you know, if that scenario is, will, it, will we still go ahead because somebody else will go ahead with this? Let's let's ask Hamid that question. So he's kind of the chief author on this. So so, so uh, what is sorry? I just uh, can you repeat the question? I was yeah. The capital cost of this is going to be very expensive, and so how do you rationalize the cost justification of something that probably is going to cost millions of dollars and potentially 
the surgical outcomes may be a little bit better or the same. Yeah, it's just a gen general commercialization question. So I'm scientists were developing these techniques. I mean, until it goes through the regulatory approvals and then the companies should take care of minimizing the cost. But I mean, sure. I'm not the best person to answer it. I mean, I push the boundaries a little bit, but in terms of, I don't know, this commercialization aspects, uh, I don't know if I can give you the best answer or not. But so with first versions of development, they cost a lot. Generally over time, the cost drop. That's the typical workflow. Or competition. So let's, right. Yeah. Yeah. So over the long run, so the prices can drop to a range that justifies the performance. But first version, usually you cannot make much sense of the cost versus the performance. That's my understanding. Basically. Yeah, I have a comment in, in there just to take that, that, you know, the cost and return on investment scenario, Dr. Papke, to the next level. Because I, you know, I think when you look at even robotic surgery right now, um, the, the cost analysis of that, I, I, I think, you know, has been shown mostly for robotic prostatectomy only. All of the other procedures that we're using the robot for haven't really panned out. And so it goes sort of to, you know, killer app kind of thing. And, and what is that, you know, I think the onus is on, on the business folks, if you will, to show what is that killer scenario clinically you know, that this really takes to another level. Um, I have to be honest, ironically, I thought of um, access to care issues in rural areas, but obviously then having a robot there, you can't afford it. But if you, if you could, you know, can't afford 10 surgeons, but you can have one robot who's willing to work uh, 24 hours a day without food, I don't know, you might be able to justify that. Um, but I, I'm just thinking, you know, what is that procedure? And I have to say really clinically, because when I was watching the video, I'm thinking a majority of the anastomoses that we're doing in a minimally invasive format is with staples. Um, and so what is that? That's the question. And, and you know, what is that killer procedure or scenario, access to care scenario, or you know, surgery on the moon scenario, kind of thing. There's something there, you know, that tells that that Star Trek story that this is very, very fitting for, and no one would question the cost because it would be obvious. Um, I think it's just something to think about as you all continue to present this work, and people are interviewing you, and you, you know, flip the question on 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 the other people in the audience. You know, I'm intrigued right now, just kind of thinking of all the scenarios over the 24 years of going to medicine meets virtual reality. Yes, I'm that old since you know for 20 25 years ago, and and thinking of all those different scenarios, there is an application that is so obvious. You know, likely we could find one that. Um, you know, the cost of benefit ratio would be would be pretty clear. And, and actually very, to extend, very well to said. Ex Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, one thing to extend this question on cost is also the opportunity cost. I was actually talking to my wife about this paper a couple of nights ago, and she was like, so what do you think? Like, do you think this is gonna take over the world? And I was like, well, I don't know, like, you know, that I can see like the whole thing is set up exactly like I would set it up for a resident. And then I would have the resident just throw the stitches in between where I'm holding the bowel. And she was like, great, so does that mean residents are out of a job? Which is, which is not an, an uninteresting question, which is the fact that, you know, if you have these robots that are doing these anastomoses and they're doing, you know, they're alleviating some of the workload of the surgeon in terms of doing what we might otherwise consider to be sort of menial or somewhat trivial tasks in the scheme of an operation, where is it the trainees are going to get their experience in learning how to do some of these things? Even hands-on anastomosis, to Dr. Pugh's point, most of what we do minimally invasively is done with staplers. And so, I mean, I can maybe count uh, just a handful of times I remember in the, in the past couple of years that I've had to do a hands-on anastomosis laparoscopically um, because so much of it is done with staplers. And then you compare that to what was done, you know, 10, 15 years ago when a lot more was being done hands-on. And then you now look around and look for, okay, who's the person that can teach me how to do this hands-on thing? 
uh, where they all go? Well, they're retired, they're on a beach somewhere. Um, and so uh, how, do we, how do we think about how these uh, automated functions could potentially impact the need for uh, training surgeons to, to be the bailout uh, if, if, a, if a non-robotic version of this is necessary? Again, very well said. And, uh, and before robots, surgical robots take over the world, they have to go through the FDA, right? So how do you think the FDA will look at autonomous robotic surgery? How are they going to measure you know, safety and ef efficacy and things like that. Um, I'm gonna throw it back to you, Daniel. I want to see, what do you think? Yeah, so this is actually a great question because when I was looking at the paper and I actually had a couple of questions for, for Justin or, or Dr. Fee or whoever wants to answer, but you know, some of the comparison metrics that you had to the operating surgeons, I was kind of curious because you had mounted this on, a, on this ring um, that simulated the breathing. But the configuration of that within the box just seemed very unusual compared to how a surgeon might otherwise set up an anastomosis. And that seemed to be reflected in the operative times, you know, like the, the phantom model times were 50, 60 minutes for the anastomosis, even the in vivo model was only 25 minutes. Um, and so I'm curious as to what level of surgeon was being compared to um, and whether they, they had preferences on how things were set up, you know, like were we comparing apples to apples in terms of the performance and things like that, so that when the FDA looks at data like this, so like, oh, yes, I can see how this is or this is not comparable to a human surgeon. So are you framing that to a question to Axel or, or Justin? Yes, yeah, 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 to, to either. To, oh, I think Justin was presenting some of that. So I'm, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll take a step back, but I can take a step at it, a stab at it, too. Um, you know, when we when we set up the anastomosis, it's definitely um, not what you see clinically. Um, but but also what you see clinically um, is not necessarily the best for the robot. We're kind of stuck in this in this odd area where, you know, do you make a robot that does exactly what a human does and tries to do what a human does better? Or do you make um, a, a setup that's better for the robot because the robot's better at sewing? And, and maybe a great example of this is the sewing machine. Like you don't, you don't bring the sewing machine to the t-shirt, you bring the t-shirt to the sewing machine and the sewing machine stays in one place. And maybe the ideal robot actually has the tissue coming to the robot and the robot staying stationary. Um, so really this, this test was done as a blend to try to be fair to uh, the robot and fair to the way the, the staging was done. Uh, if we would have had the, the tissue laid on the table or flat, picking up one edge at a time, the, the robot's only one armed currently. So maybe, maybe then the most fair comparison would have been uh, a surgeon doing the, the stitches one armed. You know, it's, it's very difficult to do, I think, in both, in both instances. So really the staging was kind of a compromise we took uh, going forward. But, but in terms of like FDA clearance, um, FDA is actually very aware of, of this robot. We had a pre-submission meeting with the FDA. Um, and interestingly, the FDA was very supportive and embraced the idea of autonomous robotics for procedures. Um, some, of, some of the mechanisms that, that they recommended we look at maybe be um, more superficial, maybe bringing the, the intestine out of the body for the first test and doing something extracorporeally, or looking at uh, maybe just skin closure superficial after the trocar placement, something a little simpler um, and not so uh, detailed as the small bowel anastomosis, but one, you know, one benefit maybe going down the road, just forward thinking, uh, the robot has the ability to start to quantify some of what makes a good anastomosis. And so when the FDA is looking at, well, uh, can I, you know, can I approve this device or not? If, if the robot has a way to try to standardize or try to say, well, I can do this part of the procedure with 80% accuracy or 80% success, uh, we, we have maybe a metric that we can start to give the FDA to start to think about and maybe shape that conversation instead of sitting back on our heels and waiting, waiting for them to drive the conversation as well. No, Justin, I love that, um, those analogies, because um, you know, laparoscopic surgery, minimally invasive surgery, because of the positioning of the camera required us to learn anatomy differently. You know, I mean, open surgery, doing open gallbladders, we were looking down on the gallbladder and the liver and, you know, the anatomy, the, the, uh, for the common bile duct and cystic duct and cystic artery were 
at the deepest depth. Now we do it and we're looking up at it this way. So it requires us to learn differently. Um, and just as you said, for us to adjust to the technology and obviously no one will question the benefits of you know, going from open to a laparoscopic approach. Um, I still, you know, for me, the educator in me, I, 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 uh, we took a big hit with adopting this new technology, this new approach that's now better in terms of surgeons, right? So, so we developed the, the, the laparoscopic approach and that technology, and there were no training courses for surgeons. And we started with that new anatomy, we were cutting common bowel ducts. And that was like at three times the rate. Was it 10, Dan? Actually, maybe 10 times the rate that was ever done. I would forget those early, I think it was 10 times the rate. We were injuring common bile ducts um, at the rate that we had never done in an open manner, just because of the difference in the anatomy and perception. So um, we learned from that. Uh, and one of the first things I remember, it was probably 15 years ago, um, there was a new carotid a mentally invasive carotid approach. And for the first time, the FDA required the company to make sure that the clinicians were trained in how to use it. And so there is now this sort of, you know, the FDA is getting into this space with certain new technology. If it's going to change um, the perspective of the humans that are necessarily in the loop, then there has to come with a training requirement. And so that, that leads to my question for you all, um, even just the setup, right? I mean, so if you're, if you're doing the anastomosis that you're talking about, someone has to resect the bowel. I mean, you, you will have done a segmental resection of some tumor or some catastrophic event. Someone has to resect that bowel, then set it up for the robot to then do the anastomosis. The robot or however that the system is set up should actually not only quantify how well the robot did the anastomosis, but also quantify how well the surgeon set up the tissue for them in order to do a great anastomosis. I could take this really far, guys, seriously, because I, I mean, the integration with technology, it, it, it's, it's here and we have to think openly about how to do it. But th those are my questions for you all. Like really, really, what is that setup and what is the surgeon doing or the person or the technician? I mean, and, and, and I mean, it has to be a clinician who understands what should be the, you know, distance. If there's a benign tumor, you can get two millimeter margins. It's cancerous or something where you're unsure you need five, you know, at least five millimeter or you know, two, three centimeter margin, something like that. Like that part has to be done right as well, or else the out overall outcome, who cares about the sutures? The overall outcome is not going to be good for the patient because they're going to get a recurrence. But there is some, there is a co-responsibility there. And if you have advanced technology, it should benefit at all levels. Uh, anyway, I could keep talking. Alex, you're smiling. I love your smiles. <laughs> 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 yeah, fantastic question and a really, really interesting discussion. Um, so, I mean, our technology right now is really just for the anastomosis step. And absolutely, we would need, uh, you know, a surgeon to resect and set it up for us. So I think that the easiest way to envision this is if, imagine you would do this procedure on, uh, with a Da Vinci-like system, right? Where you already use the robot, you perform the resection, you set it up and then just try, you know, hit a button to put it into the autonomous mode for the for the anastomosis. So that would be a very easy transition, you know, like using the same robot, everything exactly the same, same camera, just for this step, you go in, into like an autonomous drive, similar to the parking assist that I mentioned earlier. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, I think in the future, we are excited to see if we can push the boundaries further and do more steps of this, uh, you know, these surgeries, maybe do the resection as well, you know, maybe do a complete end to end, um, you know, appendectomy procedure was just a bit easier, you know, from start to finish autonomously. I mean, that's something we, we think about, we dream about, we, we would love to, you know, perform, but, but currently what we are, you know, really showed in this uh, study was just the the suturing step, the anastomosis step. 
You know, we, we have just a few more minutes to go and, and I got to get in a couple of my geeky technical questions here. Okay. You know, so, so, you know, the holy grail of surgical navigation is like you said a little bit, a three-dimensional deformation. And how do you control navigation within a, uh, you know, an ongoing random real-time deformational organ, liver, bowel, you know, you name it. And, and you've done a little bit of there looking at fluorescent guided surgery with matching it. And I imagine structured light, is that correct? Uh, fractionated structured light on the surface reflecting. Is that, is that how you're doing it? Okay. And so, so how can you apply your points of fluorescence? Um, and, and are those pellets or are those actually just injected into the tissue? And if you can't tell me, and if it's proprietary, don't tell me. How many do you want to take this one? And IR markers, yeah, they are typically injected on the tissue or placed. Yeah, and is that isocyanin green, I take it? Yeah. With, with infrared picking, okay, all right. So, so you've got that, and, and I can tell you, you're going down a right path, because to me, you know, and I'm obviously, I'm highly interested in fluorescent guided surgery and structured light, you know, and, and you know, we're working on similar stuff, would love to partner with you guys. But I, working on deformational tissue, especially brain, um, uh, liver and things like that is huge. Uh, and, and to congratulate even a, a, an anastomosis that you're able to predict with machine vision. So I guess my, you know, after this long-winded question, you know, where do you think, you know, the, the machine computer vision is going with spectral imaging that can help the machine in determining surgical navigation to guide whatever arm you're 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 inducing to move, does that make sense? Is that is that did I frame that right? I'm looking at Carla. She's got great eyes to, to let me know if I'm framing that right or not. So, yeah, yeah definitely like machine vision. So, autonomous control strategy. They have three main components: sort of the sensing, planning, and then performing. So computer vision, definitely you can go really deep in. So even remove the robot completely, just track the soft tissue. We can spend years on doing something like that. Right. So here, what we did was using these two cameras with a ray tracing method that can help us ease this process and integrate it in the autonomous control. So we were able to predict deformations, which when they got in the range of like three millimeters, which is, close to half of the size of the tool jaw. So we were doing the replanning. So that was our threshold. So if something more than that happens, so we have to replan and then continue the suture. But so we used a couple of techniques. The, again, this can go really deep. Axel showed one example of future work, which you can remove part of the imaging system, replace it with something else that is using one single camera detecting the landmarks on the tissue and all the deformation combined in one camera. So you can go that route as well. And then again, tracking landmarks and certain features on the soft tissue will be the biggest challenge because tissue can take any shape. And usually you need a, like a trained person, a surgeon to help you label that information. Then you can teach it to a computer or machine vision technique to replicate it. So it's it's a very big and open problem, I would say yeah, one, yeah, one major is. part of the autonomous control. We had yeah. all the components in there, but we can go really deep in each dimension and then work on them for years. Well, so I, can, if, 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 I, can, yeah, if I was I was just going to end it here. I know Pish is giving me the no 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 no. no, no. I, actually, I want to make sure that we have, we have some great uh, participants over here, and uh, I think Dr. Rogula is here. He's a world renowned uh, laparoscopic surgeon. I want to make sure he wants to make a comment about about the needles, uh, uh, Dr. Aguila. Hey, hi, everyone. <laughs> Great uh, to see you all. Uh, I'm actually in Texas, in the United, not in Poland, uh, how I uh, normally spend time. Uh, absolutely phenomenal um, uh, idea. I love it. Uh, so I'm a, a big fan of robotic surgery, as you know. I'm actually using all kinds of robots, including Da Vinci, the, the new one uh, by CMR called Versus. Uh, and there is also uh, one uh, provided by uh, Medtronic and uh, Zenken. So I use all of those robots. So stitching in robotic surgery uh, has always be, uh, been a, a, a major issue. Uh, and those robots providing something similar 
uh, to open surgery uh, with curved needle uh, are usually easier to uh, to apply. Uh, so I mean Da Vinci mostly. But my question is is a little bit different. There is currently a device, uh, and Matt Crow, who is online with us, I think now know that the, know the device very well. Uh, it's called Endostitch. So Endostitch is is a manual uh, tool that looks similar to what you guys presented with the straight needle passing from one uh, needle driver to or one arm to another one uh, in manual way. And I, I've been using this for last, I don't know, 20 years and the device has not been changed. It's very cheap. I think it's about $200 and it does the work beautifully. It's not automatic, not uh, automatic. But um, uh, my comment is, um, uh, uh, is is really autonom autonomic suturing uh, that much needed for uh, for even residents? Um, I don't know. There were some other comments uh, of the same kind. If uh, maybe something uh, easier, cheaper, and simpler uh, would do the same work, uh, maybe with a little bit of manual help. So that's my my general comment. No, thank you. And uh, I, I I saw like there was a question from Dr. Graham Schwartz. He's he's uh, also an amazing uh, plastic surgeon. And uh, Dr. Schwartz, do you want to ask that question, or I can uh, put it simply? But the, the question basically was, oh, there is Dr. Schwartz. Go ahead. Hey there. This this was tr you know truly amazing work. Uh, you know, and thank you uh, everyone for you know everybody's uh, a great insight here. Yeah, I, I just it was it was kind of um, uh, geeking out on my end, uh, so to speak, in terms of kind of the technical uh, aspects. And it, it sounds like Dr. Saidi addressed this a little bit in his prior comments. It was more you know it was it was more directed toward you know how do you handle these you know, soft tissue deformations when the scope of the uh, field gets bigger? Um, you know, are there strategies that um, you, know, you have found uh, work well uh, or you, you think you might be able to employ as you, you, know, you kind of build these systems out? Yeah, I think um, I think in general it's a very interesting question because it's a little it's a little backwards from what we've been doing for the last um, eight years or so. We always we started with our first system actually in open surgery, and in 2016 published a paper doing um, three dimensional soft tissue tracking, which was published in Science Translational, and that was really our first work, and that was through a laparotomy where everything was pulled out. Um, and the surgical field was outside the body. And, and since then, we've been going the opposite direction of what you're suggesting. We've been going smaller and smaller and inside the body and getting a more narrow field of view. Um, so in, in some ways, you know, I, I would be very excited to, to go back the other direction and, and bring it back to the outside of the body because you have um, many more options with technology that's, that's existing that doesn't have to be miniaturized to go inside. If you're talking about open tissue surgery, and you can have a, a much larger camera system with more capability on the outside of the body. I think certainly we can use some of our same uh, some of our same tissue tracking technologies outside the body, uh, and, and probably even do more just because we don't have to package things inside an endoscope to go laparoscopic. Um, so I, I, you know, would would be very open um, to exploring exploring more of these uh, these opportunities in some of these larger working environments. I think there could be uh, potential beyond maybe what we're currently doing as well. That would be great. I, and again, to, you know, uh, I'm sure Dr. Piquet and I would love, you know, to partner, you know, with you guys uh, on, on a, a collaboration, um, you know, with, with, pl I'm a plastic surgeon as, uh, as uh, Dr. Mather said. And so we're, we're, uh, we're maximal access surgeons. Uh, we're not minimal access, but the other component is that, I, you know, one of my other sort of specialties is microsurgery, which has quite a restricted narrow field of view, you know, and, and, you know, in terms of the tissue handling is very, very specific. So we work on both a macro and, and very micro level. And so, you know, the deformational, uh, you know, when you're trying to incorporate deformation uh, in, you know, these 
two different realms, it I it's interesting to learn, you know, are, are there different techniques that should be utilized for each, you know, uh, you know, for each application. And maybe that's also an opportunity to, uh, in part at least, answer Dr. Rogula's uh, question. I, I think uh, we started definitely with the larger, uh, you know, intestine, but are very much interested going smaller. And I think microanastomosis would be, of course, really, really great. And maybe, you know, urethra, bladder, neck would be in a nice application where there's a, a strong need. Uh, so, and there, I think it's less and less likely that there's a mechanical, you know, tool solution like the endostitch that would help. And I think robotics can shine more and more. Well, I think, uh, you know, I'm going to end with the three comments. Uh, first of all, uh, if Captain America was here, not Star Trek, he would say we can, we can do this all day. Uh, and the reason to create BrainX and BrainX community was to, to bring uh, all of us together. So I already see some, some collaboration and, and future partnerships developing over here. So, so thank you for, for that. I do want to thank the speakers and the participants for, for their awesome presentations and their, their excellent questions. And uh, please stay tuned, join BrainX community and uh, be uh, participate and help us in sharing of scientific information. So thank you everyone for joining us. I had a great evening. And uh, for our um, uh, engineering team, if surgeons don't take your robots, here's an anesthesiologist, uh, we will take your